Meine Damen und Herren, guten Abend. Ich möchte Sie im Namen der Albert-Einstein-Gesellschaft und der Uni Bern äh, willkommen heißen zur zweiten Vorlesung in diesem Zyklus äh, Einstein Lectures heute Abend. Es ist ein bisschen früher als sonst. Morgen ist es wieder um halb acht, wie immer. Und äh, ich wünsche Ihnen viel Vergnügen. Frau Tretter wird noch mal die Referentin von diesen Lectures kurz einführen für jene, die gestern Abend nicht hier waren. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Mathematical Institute and the University of Bern, I would like to welcome you to the second Einstein Lecture 2019 some of you for the first time and some of you for the second time. So for those of you who haven't been here yesterday, uh, I would like to welcome again and briefly introduce our 11th Einstein lecturer, Professor Shafi Goldwasser, one of the most distinguished computer scientists of our time. Now today, I will only mention a few of the many impressive distinctions uh, that she received. So, in addition to two professorships at the Weizmann Institute and at MIT, in January 2018, she became director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. And most importantly of this long list of awards is the last one, which you, which you see in red, uh, jointly with Silvio Micali, uh, in 2012, she was awarded the A.M. Turing Prize or award, uh, which is considered to be the Nobel Prize in computer science. She was elected to several academies, national academies. She was awarded two honorary doctoral degrees, one from her alma mater, Carnegie Mellon University, and one only recently from the University of Oxford. And, very remarkably, she was invited to U.S. Congress for a briefing on cryptography. The purpose of this was to convince politicians of the key importance of unrestricted fundamental research in subjects like mathematics and computer science. So here, unrestricted, and by the way, also in the mission of the Simons Foundation, means without purpose and without attempt to measure it in publication numbers or impact factors, just driven by the curiosity and ambition of scientists. So factorization in prime numbers and mathematical proofs we learned yesterday in Shafi's talk are very good examples for that. And I think we also understood that we can no longer ignore their importance for our present and future security in a data-driven world. Shafi, we are now very much looking forward to your second, maybe more scientific, Einstein lecture. Please. I already have. I already have. So thank you, Christian, and all of you for an incredible hospitality in the short stay here. And also thank you for those of you who have been here yesterday for coming again. Uh, today's lecture is um, much less, uh, it's more about mathematics than about sort of the general world and the impact of cryptography in the world. Um, so the title is Pseudodeterministic uh, Algorithms and Proofs. And I'll explain during the talk, what do I mean? What are these things and what do we know about them? Uh, and it's based on some joint work uh, with a student from Weizmann, uh, Iran Gatt, some collaborators, Odette Goldreich and Dana Rohn, and some graduate students at uh, MIT, Ofer Grossman and Diraj Holden, and Professor Michel Gomez. And when appropriate, I will attribute uh, the paper. So basically, um, I guess sort of the kind of starting point is that I want to comment that really 
theoretical computer science, uh, which is a field that essentially started in the 70s, in the early 70s, and goes on till today, has uh, focuses on you know computation, trying to find some fundamental ideas about uh, the nature of computation, comes up with the design of fast algorithms, and probably some of the highlights that you could credit to the field is um, this discovering and studying non-determinism, uh, randomness, a, a interaction, uh, synchronization, parallelism, locality, full tolerance. So these are all sort of big topics, each one that's been in the central focus of a study of uh, computer scientists. And it, as we all know, that it's had great impact on technology and science. Uh, and in particular, um, can you see this? Uh, it jumps. In particular, you know, fast search algorithms have brought sort of to the Google algorithm, uh, Akamai, you know, if, uh, algorithms for studying fault tolerance in networks, uh, enable routing of messages in the internet, even due to, in spite of congestion, electronic commerce that I discussed yesterday, uh, computational biology, fast algorithms uh, in genetics, quantum algorithms. So there's been a lot of impact. Uh, appar apparently, on the video, it's better to have this one. So I'll, I'll try to control it. Um, I'm just a little unfamiliar with this pointer. So uh, these ideas, which are really um, are ideas which are on paper, have also made a lot of impact. And the idea that I'm uh, concerned with in this talk, or will focus on this talk, is the question of randomness. That is, the use of randomness in computation in order to make some computations which are impossible possible to solve some problems, it, it makes more efficient is the solution of other problems and so forth. So uh, randomness has been a big topic in uh, computer science and there's a, a huge body of research uh, that's de dedicated to um, probabilistic algorithms, the construction of probabilistic algorithms. It's really starting from 1976 and I'll say a few words about that and also as you saw yesterday, I talked about probabilistically verifiable proofs starting from 1986. So if you, those who were here in the lecture yesterday recall we had this interactive proof where the one who was verifying the proof was tossing coins, so he used randomness in order to uh, generate sort of the questions and answer, the questions that he poses to the one who's proving. And also there is some n uh, embedded in the notion of a proof, there's some notion of error. So we are willing to accept uh, the proof and realizing that there might be some small amount, small chance we are mistaken. And uh, besides interactive proofs, I mentioned in a word there's something called probabilistically checkable proofs. So the this study of probabilistically verifiable proofs is actually quite an extensive one and is studied all over uh, theoretical computer science. But today what I'll talk about, so where is the pointer? I'm afraid you're not going to see it on the video because they, and they're not going to see it in the audience. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's try just a couple more slides. Okay, so today I, won't, I will talk about randomized algorithms that have an extra property. So they're not just probabilistic algorithms, but they're it, what I would call pseudo-deterministic probabilistic algorithms and proofs. So I have to define what I mean by these uh, pseudo-deterministic uh, algorithms. Uh, so first of all, just to make sure for those of you who are not computer scientists, you want to change it? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, so we're going to talk about pseudo-deterministic uh, algorithms, which are going to be special kind of, of probabilistic algorithms, and pseudo-deterministic proofs. So these are notions which I will define. In some sense, I think that the best uh, outcome of this talk is that you will understand what I mean by these notions, and maybe I'll convince you that it's interesting. Unfortunately, in order to fill an hour, I'm also going to show you some results. <laughs> so some uh, mathematical claims and some ideas of proof. So it will be a little bit more technical from that point of view. So uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when I say deterministic algorithm, we really mean just a, an algorithm, a program, takes an input, has an output, and uh, the output and the running time, so both what the output is and how, much t how many steps this algorithm took, is determined as a function of the input. So once the input is fixed, also the output is fixed and the running time is fixed. And in fact, uh, throughout the, the, the talk, I will, mention, I will talk about this P, P is a class of problems, all which can be solved by deterministic algorithms which are also efficient. Efficient meaning polynomial time, so P stands for polynomial time. 
And this is a class that was defined early in, com in, the, theory, uh, in the world of theory of computer science by Edmonds in the early 70s. And as these things go, usually even though these, we study these abstract classes, they start by one problem. And it was the problem of matching that Edmund was interested in and came up with an algorithm for graph matching and noticed that this algorithm has a much better running time than an algorithm for uh, finding large cliques in graphs, even though these two problems were very similar to each other. And then he defined a whole class of problems that are efficient algorithms, calling it P. Okay, in any case, that's a deterministic algorithm. It's just a program, you run it, you're always gonna get the same output and it's always gonna run the same number of steps. A probabilistic algorithm is different. A probabilistic algorithm not only has an input like before, but this time there is sort of a, it has the ability, in addition to execute steps, is to toss coins. How it tosses coins is not the subject of this class. It's a very interesting subject. We sort of assume abstractly there is an ability to really toss a fair coin as many times as the number of steps of the algorithm. So it could be that every step you toss a coin. Now, it's a very interesting, uh, could be a very interesting talk to talk about where this randomness is coming from. Is there randomness in principle? Uh, and if there is, is it really uh, unbiased? Or maybe there's just some entropy and you can work with it. There's a lot of results on how to extract fair looking coins from biased sources in nature. Uh, and then maybe how to use um, uh, deterministic programs to stretch it so you can get more and more bits that look random enough for the purpose of an algorithm. But for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna say, let's say for a given, we have a source of randomness. Okay, it exists and we are able to use it. So the thing to point out here is that in this case, the output of the algorithm, as well as its running time, are now not just the functions of the input, but they're also a function of the random bits that have been tossed. So in other words, if you, let's say your coin came up heads the whole, every time, so you have heads, 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 there might be, it might be a slow algorithm and it would have one kind of output. And if it was all tails, it would, might be a faster algorithm, a different output. Essentially, there's no guarantee. It could be that for every sequence of coins, there'll be a different output and a different running time. And usually when we talk about the running time of a randomized algorithm, we may talk about averaging it over the coin tosses, what is the expected running time. Um, and when we uh, prove properties about this algorithm, it has to be proved with respect to these distribution of coins. Okay, so this is a fundamental difference between deterministic and, and, and probabilistic algorithms. The, in the same way that we had this P, which was the problems that can be solved by deterministic algorithms, there's a class called BPP, <laughs> which is bounded uh, error probabilistic uh, polynomial time. But in words, it's those problems that can be solved by this type of an algorithm efficiently and solved correctly with high probability. So I will get to that definition, but essentially what it means is that it will give you a correct output. For every input, you have a guarantee over the coin tosses that the output is correct, okay? And in fact, in this, um, in this particular, for, uh, the problems that one is talking about when you talk about BPP are sort of yes, no questions. Is something true about X or not true about X, okay? So what's an example of such a problem? Uh, in fact, this is the example that it started the whole interest in probabilistic algorithm, and that was the question, given a number, n, can you test whether this number is a prime or not, quickly? So yesterday we talked about the fact that if you're given a number, a, a, a n, I would like to find out whether it's even, whether I can factor it, right? And I said this is a hard problem, classical computers take a long time, quantum computers in principle can do it quickly, but this now, I'm, I'm talking about a related problem, but different one, and that is I just want to tell whether a number is prime or composite. If it's composite, I don't want to factor it. I just want to be able to tell. So this is seemingly a simpler problem, just to be able to tell whether something is a prime number or not a prime number. So five is a prime, six is not. Uh, again, when the numbers get, get larger, it's not such an easy question. So if you just try to take the number and try to divide it by numbers smaller than it, that would be a very long time. That would be an exponential time algorithm. So it was a beautiful question. Can you tell whether a number is prime or not? Quickly. Let's say, even though you don't know how to factor, quickly. And uh, this is around early 70s, actually in Berkeley. There were two papers, one by Solovey and Strassen, who, uh, and then the other one by Mike Rabin and Gary Miller, and different uh, algorithms, but they both have the same following property. And that was, given a number, is it prime? They would say yes or no. They ran quickly. So it was one of those probabilistic algorithms that can terminate fast. However, they were always correct if they say uh, that the number is, is, 
that the number is composite. But when they say the number, because essentially when the, what the algorithm was doing was searching for an evidence that a number is composite. And when it found it, it said composite. And if it didn't find it after a long time searching, it said, I haven't found the proof, probably doesn't exist, this number is probably prime. Of course, this informal argument was formalized and one could show that the probability of making a mistake when you assert that a number is prime is, is it can be made exponentially small. So you run enough trials so that if you're confident that the coins that were used are really good coins, uh, fair coins, then you trust that the probability of error is small. Okay, so this in itself is a beautiful notion. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but this idea that you are searching for a proof in a sort of well-defined manner and if you, of some evidence of some fact, and if you don't find that you say with high probability the fact is false, which is kind of the idea of this algorithm, is what stands behind this. So this was in the, in the 70s, and since then people were like, wow, we don't know how to do this deterministically, but we can do this with coin tossing. With coin tossing, very quickly we can make these assertions. Composite prime, and we know that the correctness of our assertion is, is with high probability. And this brought on the question, can you actually do this without coins? If we can do this with coins, are coins fundamental, or can we replace the use of a probabilistic algorithm by a deterministic one that doesn't have coins? That would be better, then we don't have to worry about the randomness, whether it exists, and if it's good enough, and so forth. So then there were a sequence of papers. Um, a, so actually, let me just say that this brought on a, a general question, not just whether you can test whether a number is prime or not with a deterministic algorithm, but in general. Is it true that randomness is necessary? Or maybe you can solve all problems that can you do with, with coins without coins. Maybe it's just a easier with coins, or we just happen to find the solution. But in principle, we could do this without coins. Um, so uh, that was, that's been a major ongoing, uh, what we call de-randomization effort, trying to get the randomness away. For algorithms, it's still open. We don't know the answer. So using these letters that I introduced before, which computer scientists love using, I don't know why, to tell you the truth, but I've inherited this, is, is BPP equal to P? So the class of problems can be solved by a randomized algorithm, the same as the class of problems that can be solved without randomness. In particular, the primality problem had lots and lots of beautiful work. I, one of the works that I most like of myself with a graduate student at the time, Joe Killian, was using the theory of elliptic curves in order to devise a new primality algorithm not the one like the Rabin Miller, a primality test, the test whether a number is prime or composite and is always correct. So it doesn't have any probability of error. If it says composite, it's composite. If it says prime, it's prime. However, it still uses randomness, which is kind of an interesting question. What's randomness good for if there's no error? So randomness is used to look for the proof. It may take time to find the proof. Using randomness would guide your search so it will be faster. But at the end, you will find the proof in case it's prime and you'll find a proof in case it's composite. Okay, this doesn't mean that you can factor. Any questions? All right, but um, the most important result was in 2002, and these mathematicians, Agawa, Kayala, Saxana, which we got a lot of accolades for it, showed that actually you could tell whether a number is prime or not without any randomness whatsoever. Not for the correctness of the answer, not for the runtime, totally deterministic algorithm. Beautiful algorithm uses uh, some algebra, some very interesting ideas. Uh, so in a sense, that natural problem for which we, reason we studied this whole thing, which was whether a number is prime or not, which motivated the whole study of randomized algorithm, is not a problem anymore. We know how to solve it without randomness. Still, the general question exists, which is a fascinating sort of fundamental question. Do you need randomness or not to speed up computation? Okay, uh, so the truth is that it's kind of a, 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 a kind of a, it's a problem without a reason in some sense because we only know of one other natural problem which is testing whether uh, in a, a polynomial is identically zero, uh, which, for which we know how to do it randomized. We sort of set the variables of the polynomial at random and test whether it's equal to zero or not and quickly if we, t take, if, we, if we do this repeatedly and select numbers in some range, we know that there's a few solutions so we will find the solution that will make it non-zero and if we don't find it then it's zero. So there's only one problem, not quite. It turns out that when uh, you talk about what I call search problems, so what's a search problem? So far this prime question was, is it a prime or is it not a prime? It was a yes, no question. But usually we are interested in much bigger questions. We're not asking yes or no. We have a problem, an input X and we have lots of possible outputs. So this is what we call a search problem. And I'll use it a little bit in the talk, I'll try not too much, but there's notation. So in input X, 
The search algorithm outputs a Y. A Y now could be a long string, not just zero, one, a long answer. But what has to be true is that there's some relation that's true between X and Y. If such a Y exists, some relation is true. So for example, X could be a logical formula, you know, uh, a, a, a logical formula and, uh, from logic, and you want to know if this formula is true or not. And uh, essentially an assignment to the variables of the formula will tell you whether it's true or not. So the relation between X and Y will be true if in fact this uh, assignment satisfies the formula. So for those of you who are not sort of familiar with logical formulas, if we think about X as a graph, and we're looking for a short path in the graph, or we're looking for some kind of substructure in the graph, and uh, if it exists, one of these substructures is solution. Okay, so very natural. It's just, I've enlarged myself from asking yes, no questions to general search questions, okay? All right, and that's gonna be our interest in this talk, and uh, just, to, there are two examples that are gonna be especially interesting to us. First example still has to do something with primality. Okay, so given a number, I know quickly to tell whether it's prime or not, using some algorithm, which doesn't use coins. But how about this problem? Uh, I give you a size, in, like 1,000 bits or 2,000 bits, and I ask you to give me a prime of that size. Just give me one, okay? Turns out that actually to find a prime is not such a simple problem. So the best we know how to do is to choose a number at random between let's say 1,000 bits and 1,001 bits, okay, and test whether it's a prime. So we choose at random a string, and then we run this test that exists to tell whether it's prime or not. And we know that there's, the density of primes is that there are a lot of primes in these intervals, so quickly we'll find one. But we don't know a deterministic procedure that will hand you a prime. Why this matters, we'll see later. But take it on faith that this is an interesting problem, how to generate primes of a given size. And we really don't know. We can do it probabilistically, as I said, choose one at random and test it. We don't know how to do it deterministically. And uh, that's a search problem. And this is a, okay. What's another problem that I will talk about in this talk? That is you're given a, a graph a, and you're asked, find a perfect matching in the graph. So what do I mean by perfect matching? So a graph, you've got nodes, you've got edges between the nodes. I'll show a picture of it in a couple of slides. Um, and uh, matching is how do you match two nodes together? If they have an edge between them, you can match them. If they don't have an edge, you can't. How can you match all, uh, essentially perfect matching, make sure that every single node in the graph is matched to somebody? So people usually think about, in the States at least, you have medical schools, you have apl applications to medical schools, and, you, uh, although, and there you want to match uh, a student to a medical school, but it's not a single student. So a better example is maybe you have uh, a room full of people and you want to match them, uh, you want to have one friend, so I want to match all the friends here, could be boys and girls, girls and girls, boys and boys, whatever you like, and in any case, you have to have a perfect matching, everybody gets matched and you have a unique uh, match. So this problem, this matching problem, is another one of these sort of fundamental problems. As I told you, it was a problem that started with uh, Edmonds on his quest of polynomial time algorithms. And for example, we know how to do it randomized, even in parallel, extremely quickly. And uh, parallel is another notion later, uh, but we don't know how to do this uh, deterministically. So the question of how to do, whether you need randomness ex extends from also efficient algorithm to efficient parallel algorithms. And there are these outstanding problems, many of them, for which we know how to do randomly, but we don't know deterministically. Okay, all right. So, I claim that there are randomized search algorithms everywhere. We use it all the time. Obviously, we use it in statistics because you're using sort of statistics if there's no randomness, there's no field. Uh, but uh, what I mean is in the context of computer science, sort of there's input and then there's outputs. There's uh, uh, sublinear algorithms, as I mentioned already, sequential and parallel. There's sublinear algorithms, distributed algorithms, streaming algorithms, space-bounded algorithms, routing, log balancing, optimization, cryptography, learning, game theory. So randomness is very crucial in each one of these fields. Um, you know, so uh, one would have to study each one of these fields to, and, and show you examples. We, we don't have time for it. And the reason why people usually go from deterministic to randomized is three reasons. First, sometimes it's simpler. Sometimes designing a randomized algorithm might be extremely simple, but if you design a deterministic one, it would be overly complicated. You'd, if you're thinking about it, writing a program even to do so, the deterministic one might be so complicated that you would be afraid of mistakes in the code where a randomized one would be simple. 
Uh, often these are faster algorithms. So if you have randomized algorithms, it could be much faster than deterministic algorithms. And sometimes you can even prove that it's impossible to solve unless you had randomization. Okay? So it's, sometimes it's actually necessary. A, so deterministic solutions don't exist. And I won't show an example, but I'll say it in words. The, the well-known problem is suppose you have a, a, deter, a network of people that can speak to each other, and, one, and they want to agree. What does it mean agree? You usually call it the consensus problem. So each of you have a vote. You either want to vote uh, Republican or Democrat or some kind of zero one vote. And we want the following property, that if all of you want to do Republican, Republican gets elected. If all of you Democrat, Democrat gets elected. So they call this the Byzantine general. All the Byzantine generals have to fire, fire at once. Um, but there's one of you who's a fault, faulty. Faulty, he, he tries to confuse. He doesn't follow the protocol. So he might say to one person, I am interested in Democrat, I'm interested in Republican. Is there any way for them to agree? Turns out n there is no deterministic way to agree if there's no a common clock. If there's a common clock, there are things you can do. But if there's no clock and we're just sending each other messages, hoping that at some point it converges, you can show that it's impossible to converge. However, if you use randomness, you can converge very quickly. So there's something about the ability of tossing a coin that breaks ties and is able to uh, make such a, a large distributed system reach a decision. Anyway, so this is all about the nature of randomness, okay? Sometimes it helps because it's simpler, faster, sometimes you have no choice. So, and it's also in cryptography, by the way, which is my field, which is probably why I'm so interested in randomization, there's a lot of uh, problems that we need to implement crypto systems, like finding primes. That problem I mentioned before. We need primes in order to generate those big numbers n from yesterday. Remember n was a product of 2p times q. How do you generate primes? How do you find um, generators for cyclic groups, quadratic non-residues? Again, those of you for this familiar, fine. Otherwise, the slide is really just uh, a step on the way. Finding irreducible polynomials, square roots, p q roots, points on elliptic curves. So these are basic steps in a lot of cryptographic constructions, and we only know randomized algorithms for them. We don't know deterministically how to do this. So, um, you know, these are open questions, how to do it deterministically. Okay, uh, so the usual problem that people look at is they say, they, we don't like randomness. Why don't we like randomness? It's a very good question. I'm now uh, interested in this topic of fair, fairness of algorithms. So we had a big uh, meeting with people from social science and law about fairness. And you know, they're talking about cases like there's two students, they have perfectly identical folders. Let's say they're both uh, applying to Harvard or to Bern. And you have to decide which student to accept. So if they're identical, to me as a computer scientist, the right thing to do is you toss a coin and you choose one of them. That is the fair answer. But to anybody, at least the people I talk to in social science, this seems like a terrible idea. It's like, this is not fair. Why should a coin toss make a decision? You see my point? Uh, anyway, okay. So uh, in any case, uh, it would be better if there were no coins, uh, apparently, according to a lot of people. And uh, Van Neumann specifically is a quote, anyone who considers arithmetic method of producing random digit is, of course, in a state of sin. So the question is, where are these coins coming from? Do we have them? Do we not have them? And that's a difficult physics question uh, and so forth. So the traditional goal is, let's de-randomize. Let's replace probabilistic algorithms by deterministic ones. They might be more complicated. They might uh, take more time. But at least we know that we don't have to worry about whether coins exist or not, or whether the coins we are using are biased or not. Okay, but for this lecture, I actually want to ask a different question, and that is, I like randomized algorithms. I'm going to assume there are coins that I can use, but I want to improve randomized algorithms or probabilistic algorithms to give the same guarantees as deterministic algorithms. Okay, so what do I mean by the same guarantees? What are the guarantees that a probabilistic algorithm gives you? A more a general one, not a particular one for a particular problem. Okay, a, good. So that's the goal. So what are, some what are the guarantees? If we want to put it in a table and understand to compare deterministic algorithms versus probabilistic ones, what is it we don't get when we have a randomized algorithm? So first of all, so this is the deterministic column. We look at its runtime, we look at its output. This is, these two are two different types of randomized algorithms, and people give them names. They're Monte Carlo algorithms. They're Las Vegas algorithms. Both have casinos, so both use coins, but they have different properties. Um, 
So the deterministic algorithm, we know that it, the runtime is going to be fast because we're looking at polynomial time. They're always going to be correct. That's a guarantee of when we say that we've designed an algorithm for a problem, it's a correct algorithm, runs in a certain amount of time, we claim. If it's randomized, again, the time is going to be efficient. That's essentially true for both of them. This is expected. Never mind. Both of them are fast. However, Monte Carlo may make an error. It will tell you what's the probability that there's a mistake, whereas Las Vegas always will be correct, or he says, I don't know, it out with bot. Okay? So these are the type of um, randomized algorithms we have and the guarantees they give on running time and correctness. Looks pretty good. If the probability of error is really small, it's never going to happen. Okay? Or the probability that it says, I don't know, is really small, it's never going to happen. So what's the difference? It seems like it gives you what you want anyway from an algorithm. So the difference is the following. And that is, when you run a deterministic algorithm, not only that it's efficient, it runs in polynomial time, but you also have a guarantee that on the same input, it's always going to produce the same output. You run it again, same output. You run it again, same output. So I know that a lot of people in the audience here are scientists, physicists, chemists, and so forth. Biologists, I mean, I don't know if biologists, but I haven't met any yesterday. But, it, but, but in any case, the idea of running an experiment and getting always the same answer is pretty fundamental. Um, in fact, I would say that's how you verify that these experiments are, 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 are correct in the sense that they are predictable, reproducible. So the deterministic algorithm, same input, same output. A randomized algorithm, whether it's the Las Vegas type or Monte Carlo, every time you put a new input, a different output. This is the nature of the algorithm, because remember, it depended not only on the input, but also on the coin tosses. And if the coin tosses were different, it could be a completely different output. So what I'd like to say is that um, I don't like it. I'd like to have new type of randomized algorithms that they are run efficiently, they don't make mistakes, except for maybe small probability of error, which is exponentially small, and they always produce the same output and the same input. Okay? S good. Um, why is it important? Well, again, in science, it's obvious why it's important, but sort of from the point of view of an algorithms person, the reason this is important is you would say uh, for debugging, say, suppose you have a bug in your program. It's a probabilistic program. And every time you run it, you, you want, you, you, in order to debug it, you'd like to know how it behaves if you change a line in the program. But if in any case, every time you run it, it gives you a different answer, it would be kind of hard to debug. Um, for distributed algorithms, let's say you have an algorithm that many processors are working together to solve a problem. Again, having a deterministic solution, everybody's coordinating toward the same solution is very important. Uh, for cryptography, essentially, if you think about my slide that says that all these steps in cryptography that we need to do, like generating primes, generating points on elliptic curves, and so forth, often there's a system somebody put in place. There are these parameters, like the prime or the generator, or the reducible polynomial that everybody is using. And who generates these parameters? Often it's an authority, a government, a, an agency. And you would like to make sure that they haven't introduced what we call a trapdoor, so they don't have a side door to, let's say, break the system or a, have some other method of, of surveillance or so forth. So it's a problem that we always talk about. How do you generate system-wide parameters if you distrust whoever is generating it? So if you're using a probabilistic algorithm, it sort of, in some sense, lends itself to the ability of choosing one output versus another output, because one output might be more to your liking because it's a trapdoor. So we would like to have unique outputs. So there's lots of reasons why would you like to have a unique output. And that gives me a new definition. So this is uh, the work with Elan Gatt from Weizmann. And that is, let's define randomized algorithms in a new way. So you take a randomized algorithm and you restrict it further. We are interested in those randomized algorithms. So it's a probabilistic algorithm, or randomized, I keep choosing both terms. We'll say it's pseudo-deterministic. So it's not deterministic, it's just pseudo-deterministic. That is, it still uses coins. If the following is true, that for every input, again, the runtime is fast. The correctness is that it does solve the search problem with big, good probability. Usually we say greater than 2 thirds. 2 thirds doesn't sound like very much. So you repeat it and you take a majority to decrease the probability of correctness. But the new thing is that there's a canonical answer. So there exists some, this search problem, there's some answer that comes up. Uh, so here, um, the notation is this is the input and this is the randomness that the algorithm used. So the probability over the randomness that you, always, that you get this output, the canonical one, is more than half. Let's say it's more than 2 thirds. So these 2 thirds here are just arbitrary, bounded away from the half probabilities. The point is uh, there is a majority answer, an answer that will come up more often than not, and that means that I can amplify these probabilities. So another way to think about it, if you don't like the 2 thirds is 
these algorithms will give an answer which is correct with extremely high probability. Furthermore, it will be unique. So there's some small chance that a different answer will come up, but it's exponentially small. Okay, so I want, why do I call this pseudo-deterministic? Because I want to say, let's say that there are two different algorithms. And you are, uh, you are the judge and I, I'm here behind the curtain and I'm either using a deterministic algorithm or I'm using a pseudo-deterministic algorithm of the kind I defined here that uses coins. And you give me an input, I give you an output. You give me another input, I give you, or even the same input, I give you an output. So I want you not to be able to tell whether I'm using a deterministic one or a pseudo-deterministic one. If I was using just a regular randomized one, after a few trials on the same input, I would give you different outputs each time. But with the pseudo-deterministic one, I always give you the same answer. So it's indistinguishable from the deterministic algorithm in terms of the input-output behavior. Okay, questions? Just because we went to, yes. And also the deterministic one. Ah, so, uh, uh, you want to know how it works? Okay. So the deterministic one is actually um, probably I cannot give it to you on the fly. But the probabilistic one, the idea is the following: is you choose a number x less than this, let's call it p, the number you're trying to find if it's prime or not. You choose x at random, which is uh, doesn't divide p. Of course, if it divides p, you know p is not prime. So you choose x at random from one to p, and you take it to the power p to minus one over two. Uh, and it turns out that if, uh, if your number was, um, if your number was prime, then this should be either one or minus one, okay? And um, if not, then it might be different than one and minus one. So you keep doing this and as soon as, I mean, I'm simplifying. It's not completely correct, but essentially correct. Uh, as soon as you take it, find an x, so you choose an x at random, take to the power of p minus one over two. If it's different from one and minus one, then you know it's composite. Because if it's prime, it will always be uh, either one or minus one. The reason is because x to the p minus one, p minus one is the order of a group. x to the p minus one, the order of the group gives you, taking x to the order of the group gives you back one. Uh, if p is prime, then there are uh, p minus one elements smaller than it, which are relatively prime with it, which are, we don't divide it. So it's really kind of a side, but uh, <laughs> there, Maybe I can tell you later, but there's a simple calculation, this exponentiation, where it's a simple equation that you test to see whether you get one or minus one or something else. And if you get something else, you know it's not prime. Okay, uh, you choose these x's at random. Okay, uh, in any case, in my algorithm, I'm not looking for decision, I'm looking for search problems. So I wanna find just not a yes, no, but more generally. And, um, although yes, no is included in it, but it's much more interesting for general problems. And the issue is now is that I, I require that there's a canonical answer, okay? So what's, um, so what's an example, uh, so do they exist? Obviously they exist because uh, deterministic algorithms are a special case of a randomized algorithm. So and deterministic algorithms have unique answers. But the question is whether they extend deterministic algorithms. So in other words, can you go is there some problem that requires randomness and still can guarantee unique solutions or canonical solutions? And um, it's been studied uh, in several contexts, in sequential, parallel. I'll give you a little bit of, tell you a little bit about it. Um, and uh, it's been discovered for some natural problems in number theory, algebra, graph th algorithms. And on the other hand, so usually when we ask this type of question is does it extend deterministic algorithms, we're asking, on one hand, can you show examples where we don't know how to do it deterministically? And on the other hand, can you actually show separations? Can you really show that there are inherently things can be done deterministically and things that can require randomness but can give you canonical answers? Okay, so this is a, a sort of a more gen, a general study. Um, and it's an interesting question of how you come up with these algorithms a, for problems where it's not obvious. And I'll show you some examples. So. A little parentheses here. <laughs> it's 
So I'm teaching one more thing, which is going to be useful to explain some separation results. And that is, um, we have these days something that's called a sublinear algorithm. What's a sublinear algorithm? That's just like the program before, but they have the, which, which got an input and got out an output, but it has this extra property that makes it sublinear, which is, if this is the input, okay, the X that came into the box, you're, the algorithm is not actually allowed to read the entire input. So it's sublinear, it's only allowed to look at a, a sublinear number of bits in the input. So for example, if you think about, I don't know, the cosmos or something, you can't look at everything, you can sample it. Or if, you know, usually a beautiful example is the dinosaurs. You, know, you don't find a full dinosaur, you find some bones, and yet people make theories that this dinosaur was a, a, a meat eater, a, a vegetable eater, <laughs> herbivore. A so in other words, just from examining some properties to try to give an answer about uh, the input. Those are sublinear algorithms. They have sort of a huge field at this point. And uh, these algorithms are always randomized. So randomness is extremely important because you would randomly choose which bits of the input to look at. So one question is, can you make these uh, sublinear algorithms a pseudo-deterministic? So to give you always the same answer, even though they're using randomness. And um, generally, of course, where you look at the input will determine the solution you give. Uh, so it seems like there's no hope for a canonical solution. And it turns out that that's not true. Sometimes you can get canonical solution if you do it in a clever way. But what you can show, which is of importance to this part of the talk, uh, is that there's a separation. So there are some search problems where if you were allowed randomness, you know, really without restriction of requiring a unique solution, you could do it in, with a constant number of queries into the input. Just look at the constant number of places. If you were allowed to do it, um, a, with randomness but required pseudo-determinism, so you required a canonical output, you need to do these many queries, so it's sublinear, it's not n, but it's still not constant. And uh, if you want to solve it deterministically and get 100% correctness, then uh, you need to look at the entire input. So in other words, there's a separation between these three types of algorithm. Randomized, randomized with canonical answers, what I'm, this talk, pseudo-deterministic, and uh, indeterministic. So at least it shows that within some field, the sublinear algorithms, this is a different beast. So requiring canonical answers is a strong requirement which separates it from deterministic, from randomized, but also can do better than deterministic. Okay. So how do you design such, a pro such an algorithm? If you really want to you get canonical answers, okay, how do you do it? So there's sort of two, me two methods. One method is that you, I call it canonize. canonize. You take a randomized algorithm, a canonical, a regular randomized algorithm, which doesn't require unique solutions, and you somehow you find one solution, and then you make it so that from all the solutions you possibly may find, depending on your randomness, you can do a small search into the unique one. Each problem is different, but this is kind of the blueprint of how you go from a random solution, how do you find the unique one? Is first you find a random one, then you reduce it to a canonical. The more interesting path, okay, and now <laughs> comes things which are a bit more technical, is the realization that you can reduce every search problem to a decision question. So remember, decision was a yes, no question. Search was just a regular search. You can output even longer answer. So it turns out that um, a, if I give you a general search problem, um, and I show you, and you can find how to reduce this to a decision question that can be solved by a randomized algorithm, then your search, alg search problem can be solved by a canonical randomized algorithm. Okay, so this is a characterization of these new algorithms, these canonicals or pseudo-deterministic algorithms, which they look like essentially deterministic procedures that have sort of a call to a randomized yes-no question, uh, which can be decided, um, I mean, to a yes, no question, which can be decided by a randomized algorithm. So if your problem looks like that, so it's all deterministic. Every, so those boxes that I had with deterministic where input comes in and out comes, comes out, suppose you just had a box, but it also had like a yes, it, there was one thing it didn't know, it had to ask whether something is true or false, and there was a randomized algorithm to solve that, then you can make that entire thing uh, uh, to find canonical solutions. The idea being really is that you kind of look, find the canonical solution by, look, by finding its value in every single bit, the smallest bit, second bit, and so forth. Anyway, it's a characterization. Um, 
What it means is that I told you that this was an open question, P versus BP, BPP, are they the same? Uh, you can ask the same question about the search version. This was the decision questions, these are search questions. And essentially what this tells you is that if you ever somebody would solve this problem, and usually you know how yesterday somebody asked me about P versus NP, that people believe that P is different than NP, but what if it's the same? This is a question where even though it's been open for 30 some years, most people would bet that randomized algorithm and deterministic algorithms are the same when you talk about decision questions. If they were able to show that, it would mean essentially that if you wanted to address the same question about search problems, any, uh, any uh, pseudo-deterministic search problem would become deterministic. Okay, in any case, it's, uh, so I'm saying that there's a very tight relationship between this random, de-randomization question for decision problems and de-randomization question for search problems, and it goes through this concept of search pseudo-deterministic. All right, um, let's do examples. So it's uh, Tuesday, and it's late. <laughs> uh, I think you, uh, the concept you understand, let's, do some example with some pictures. Um, so I'm gonna do an example about matching, okay, in the parallel setting. So when I say parallel, uh, again, there's another class of problems we study in theoretical computer science. The idea is that there's a lot of processors. Each one of them can send messages to the other. And, it's, and you're hoping that by having a lot of processors rather than one, you're cutting down the time, hopefully, logarithmically. So if some, before it took n squared step, now you would be hopeful for logarithmic and, and polynomial squared steps or something like that. You'd really want to do it way faster because you have all these computers to your disposal, but it's not so clear. You know, how do you, what subproblem do you assign that to them? How do you coordinate to take advantage of the fact that you have lots of processors? So this is a problem. It's called NC are those problems that can be solved quickly in logarithmic parallel time. RNC is those problems that you need pro coin tosses to solve in uh, logarithmic or polylogarithmic parallel time. The issue really with these sort of randomized algorithm is that they require a lot of coordination. So that's what I'm going to talk about from here on. Suppose you have a picture. Nice, finally a picture. <laughs> um, so here's the picture. Picture is a graph. These are the boys, say, and these are the girls. Uh, or these are uh, the medical schools and the students. But let's talk about the fact that we have, let's say, boys and girls, and this is an edge between them. There's an edge between this boy and this girl, this boy and this girl, but these two don't have an edge between them. An edge means that they can be matched. And the question of matching here is, uh, how do you find a, a way to match boys and girls so that every boy is matched to every girl? I mean, every boy is matched to a single girl. Uh, <laughs> So here, for example, the red, this guy, the red are the matchings. We chose a subset of these edges and matched them. So this is a problem which uh, it's not so uh, simple how to do it. It's uh, one of these problems that has been studied, not to death, but there's very interesting algorithms to it. And I've restricted looking here at bipartite graphs. So there's either you're a boy or a girl. There's edges only between boys and girls here, not between the boys and not between the girls, okay? So a general graph, you would have edges among any pair of circles can have an, a line between them. Okay, so this is a problem where you can think about the decision question, which is, is there a way to match everybody? Is there a way to match every boy to every girl in a way that's a unique match and nobody is left unmatched? And there's a search question, which is find the matching. So one is, does it even exist? Some graphs, it's not true. So somehow there's some conflicts that make it impossible to match everyone. And the third question is find one. And these are fundamentally different questions, okay? And it turns out that um, you can state this as an algebra problem. So here's the, here's the graph that I had before. Uh, maybe it's a little different, but so let's say that I give names to these boys, one, two, three, and names to these girls, the first, the second, and the third girl. Now I can look at a matrix, okay? So the matrix here that I've defined here is like this. There are either zeros here or variables, right? There will be a zero if there's no edge. So between two and two, there's no edge. And that's why if you go to the, uh, this entry, the two, two entry, there's a zero. But if there is an edge, let's say between three and three, then I put a variable, x3, three, three. It's just a symbolic matrix, which I can define. And it turns out that if you look at this matrix, and you look at its symbolic determinant, so you just write the, the expression for the determinant of this matrix, 
then if there is no perfect matching in this graph, then this is an identically zero. All these terms are going to be zero. So there's always going to be some zero multiplied here in every single term. But if there is um, a way to match everybody successfully, then there will be at least one uh, term here which doesn't go away, which isn't multiplied by zero. And in particular, if you see here, this matching, three goes to two, two goes to three, one goes to one, this is a term that doesn't disappear. So there is a way to get a perfect matching in this graph. In fact, the number of perfect matching is exactly the non-zero terms. Okay, so why did I do that? Well, first of all, it's always nice in mathematics to see that you can see equivalents from different kinds, even when it's this simple, especially when it's this simple. Um, and uh, this tells you that w in a way to decide whether there's a perfect matching in this graph, it's equivalent to telling whether this polynomial here is identically zero or not. If it's identically zero, no perfect matching. If it's not identically zero, there is a, a perfect matching. So how do you test that, uh, how do you tell whether this is identically zero or not? You're not gonna assign, you could assign all possible values, but good luck. Instead, um, what you could do is you choose random values for variables and see whether this thing cancels out and gives you a zero or not. So you, you plug in, you see if you get zeros. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a procedure. Plug random values for x, check if it's determined as zero. And in fact, you can uh, show that uh, by choosing these x's in the right range, uh, this will give you, this is a very quick procedure. And not only that, can be done in parallel. Why can be done in parallel? Think about these x's as like a processor. And uh, essentially, these guys assign themselves value and make a computation distributively and, comp and very correctly see, quickly see if the, if they evaluate, the determinative value is to zero or not. So it could be done in parallel. It doesn't have to be done deterministically. Great, but what about finding the matching? All I know now is there exists one, but I don't know which term it is that to find. So the one observation, which is sort of a nice observation in general, is that if there was a unique perfect matching, if there was only one, there was only one term that became non-zero, then you could actually use this procedure that we had to test whether there exists one to actually find one. So why is that true? Why is there a reduction here between f finding to testing? And the idea is essentially for each edge in parallel, for, you know, edge was a variable there, for each edge, decide quickly and randomly, this is randomized parallel, if when you take that edge away, there's still a matching. So if you take that edge away, there's still a matching, it wasn't necessary, okay? And then you take another edge, you say, is this one necessary? If I took it away, there's, is there still a matching? Yes, it's not necessary. If I took an edge away and now there is no matching, I know this is necessary. So if it was unique, very quickly, I'm only left with those edges that participate in the matching, done. Good? So if you are disposable, when I took it away, still there is a matching. That's the only idea. This only works, however, if there's a unique matching. Because if there's more than one, it could be that I'm removing things um, and somehow at the end I will be, be left with an inconsistent set of edges. It's kind of clear. Um, so are we lucky? Is it true that there's always a unique one? So the answer is no. Not only that there's not always a unique one, but there's really uh, an exponential number of them. You know, uh, there could be an exponential number of matchings. So there, this reduction from decision to search doesn't work. Now remember this whole talk is about finding unique solutions. So where am I getting to? I want to have an algorithm that given a graph, uh, in parallel finds a matching and it finds always the same one. Same graph, same unique matching. But first I have to tell you that I actually know how to find the matching if I were allowed randomness and I didn't require uniqueness. And this was a very beautiful paper by Karp, Upfar, and Vigderson, and then eventually the one I'm showing is by Malmoli, Vazirani, Vazirani. And this is a beautiful idea which I think is useful elsewhere. Probably in any, everybody can find, even if it's only to give your high school student a riddle, uh, use for this uh, theorem. And that is the following. They say, okay, if there was a unique way to match, I could find it because there's this, I could tell whether there exists one, then do this trick of removing edges. Um, so what they say is this, let's, we have a graph, it has exponential number of matching. How are we going to isolate one matching? One, the one that we should be thinking about. And their idea is, they say just put numbers at random on these edges. So these are what we call weights. So pick some random weights in some interval. So now, for example, before this, it were just lines. Now the cost of this line is six. The cost of this line is 10. 
the cost of this line is four. So I put some numbers at random in a range. And I could talk about now, if I choose a matching, what the weight of the matching is, which is just summing up the weights. So I could sum up six plus six plus three plus three uh, plus, I guess, four here. No, I don't know why that four is there. Anyway, I could sum up the weights on the edges that are in the matching. And um, let's say I choose among all of them the one of minimum weight. Then you can prove that with very high probability over the choice of these weights, there exists a unique minimum weight matching. It could be also that there are two matchings and they have exactly the same weight and it's the smallest one. But one can show that's unlikely to be the case. So if you choose random weights, with very high probability there's a unique one. So why is that good? Because remember, we had this reduction from decision to finding in case there was a unique answer. So what, I, what they do essentially is they show a reduction to this problem, to, to from the decision whether there exists a perfect matching or not, to finding the matching of unique weight, uh, of minimum weight. And since that one is uh, unique, th this reduction from decision to search works. So it's a beautiful, this, uh, if they call the isolation lemma, sort of how you isolate one solution among many solutions, and it's using this randomized trick, uh, which is kind of a general trick for all kinds of uh, structures, particularly here for this graph. But, uh, and this is the lemma, uh, choose the weights of each edge at random from this um, universe, then with high probability if the graph has at least one perfect matching, there is a unique minimum weight matching. And um, so that's an algorithm to find one. Choose a random weight assignment, find the unique minimum weight matching. The thing is, does this solve my problem of a randomized algorithm with unique answer? No, because a randomized problem with unique answer a, like a pseudo-deterministic algorithm that I've, I'm after in this talk, means that for the same input, always the same output. So the same graph, always the same matching. But notice that this thing has the step that you choose a randomized weight. So every time the weights are different, you isolate a different minimum weight matching. So it actually doesn't solve our problem. Okay, I would like for the, regardless of these randomized weights, that there will always be the same output. So the idea then is, um, is the following. And that is, uh, for many years, people have worked on trying to sort of de-randomize this, to try to, instead of coming up with randomized weights, come with some algebraic way to assign weights in a clever way, to isolate it uniquely, the minimum weight. And uh, they've been able to do it for all specialized type of graphs, but not, let's say, for bipartite graphs. Then there was this paper uh, in 2016 which showed how to de-randomize it, but used more than a polynomial number of processors. So it wasn't as fast as what we want. But what we are going to do in this work, or what we did with, uh, um, with Grossman, with Ophir, was a way to not de-randomize, but uniquify. So somehow, out of all these um, uh, matchings, find the unique one each time, regardless of what randomness was used. And the idea um, is kind of this. I'm just going to give it there, <laughs> um, and, and because uh, it sort of gives a hint if how to do this maybe for other problems. So first of all, we construct, this is Ophel, we construct deterministically some weight assignment. So as before we chose it at random, we're gonna have some algebraic way to assign weights, okay? It's still not going to be, I won't be able to prove that there's a minimum uh, weight assignment which is unique, a minimum weight matching which is unique with respect to these weights. But what I'll be able to do now is show some property. And the property is that if I now said to myself, you know what, okay, maybe there's more than one uh, matching. Let's take the union of all the edges which participate in some minimum weight matching. Some edges don't participate, some do. The graph becomes a little smaller. I could prove that with respect to the weights that we assign deterministically, the graph is quite small. And uh, a, essentially the only randomized step here is gonna be computing the union uh, of these minimum weight matchings. The point really for us in the kind of, you know, 20,000 foot uh, view is that this is a new algorithm. It is still randomized. There is a randomized step here. But even though you're using it to find the union of all these perfect matching, even though there are lots of perfect matchings, their union is unique. So there's only one union, okay, and you are trying to build it using randomization. So even though you're using randomization, the, the, the structures you're building or these unions are unique. And you do this again and again, the union becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, till it's left with a single 
minimum weight matching, and that's the one you output. All right, too much uh, detail, we'll skip. Uh, this is just the, the weight assignment, very simple, you know, essentially you assign uh, names to the, to, the, to the vertices and you take powers. Uh, what else do I want to say uh, going beyond this particular problem? Uh, so we did it for bipartite graphs, now people know how to do it for general graphs. This is a paper by Anari and Vazirani. So again, having a randomized algorithm that gives a unique uh, perfect matching in parallel and uses randomization. Uh, there's been other studies about this concept of randomized algorithm with a unique answer. A, for example, you could look at algorithms whose restriction is that they use only, they only lose a small amount of space. So these are algorithms that are studied quite extensively where um, in, in lots of contexts where you don't have a lot of space, you have a small amount of space. And it turns out the randomization is pretty uh, important for these algorithms. And you could again ask the question is, even though it's randomized, can you guarantee unique output? And here the answer is interesting. It says we, we don't know how to guarantee unique outputs, but we can guarantee a small list of possible outputs. So we can somehow, instead of output a unique solution, we say here's a, a bunch of candidates, but it's small, few. And regardless of what randomness you use, it's going to be one, I'm always going to output a, a short list. And these lists all have one answer that's always in common. Um, what's, a, uh, what's another thing I would like to say? What about that prime finding problem that I said in the beginning? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to find, I give you 1,000 bits, 2,000 bits, you give me always a, the same prime. And you can use randomness as far as I'm concerned. Can you do that? Give me always the same one using randomness. That's still an open problem. So that's a, a beautiful, anyone here interested in number theory, very clean problem. How do you find the unique prime? Always the same one using randomness. And uh, we don't know how to do it. There is a theorem, recent one, a, by Olivis and, and Santaram from, from Oxford. And they show that there's something called a sub-exponential pseudo-deterministic algorithm. That means it takes more than polynomial time, but less than what the deterministic procedure would take. So there is something to do, but you can't get, go all the way. Um, let me see, uh, in terms of, you can ask this about approximation. Suppose you want to do some approximation for a problem, and uh, you would like uh, there always to be the same approximate solution that comes up, a, or some, a solution that achieves the same approximation factor. Again, there's this uniqueness, but it's not exactly the same uh, solution, it's just that there's some property of the solution that is guaranteed, like the approximation factor. And that's also been studied. Uh, now I'm going to spend five more minutes and then I'm done, okay? So far, I'm switching gears. So far, I talked about finding a unique solution. But what about, uh, so having a new type of algorithm, but what about just verifying that a solution is unique? So suppose it's too hard to find a unique solution uh, using randomness. But and let's say that I'm all powerful. I'm able to, let's say, enumerate all possible randomness, see all possible answers, take, let's say, the lexicographically smallest one. I know that's unique because it's the lexicographically smallest but it takes me a long time to do it. Can I prove to you quickly, can you verify quickly that this is the lexicographically first one? How, I mean, I, you don't have time to look at all the possible answers. How can I prove to you that something is unique? So this is in the line of the type of things I talked yesterday about having a prover and a verifier. Uh, and here I, I want to give them a solution and prove that the solution is a unique one. This is joint work with uh, Ophel Gossman and, and Diraj Holden, and they're both students at MIT. So just to illustrate and have some pictures for comic relief for the end, um, so the prover, for example, let's say there's a graph, and she says to this verifier, she's all powerful. We don't care about, we only care about verifying quickly. She says, this graph, I could color the vertices with red, white, and green so that no edge has the same color on both ends. So she gives him the coloring, he checks it, everything is happy. But, and he's assured at the end, now we're not trying to do zero knowledge or anything. He's assured at the end that the graph is three colorable and he knows the coloring. But can he be assured that this coloring is canonical in some sense? I mean, he would take any coloring. Can you somehow guarantee that this is the coloring that has um, somehow uh, fewest number of reds or whatever, some property that you could define so that you always get that canonical coloring? That's the question that we are asking. 
Uh, another problem is, say you have these two graphs, two molecules, whatever, and they are the same, they are isomorphic to each other. It means essentially it's the same graph drawn differently. So one of the big problems in computer science is, how do you, can you tell if given these two graphs, they're really isomorphic to each other? So they are the same graph drawn differently. Again, there are lots of isomorphisms often in these graphs, not in this one, but. Um, and um, certainly, if he, she's really hardworking, she found a way to map these uh, vertices, like three to three, four to two, two to one, five to four, and one to five. And he can verify that this is an isomorphism. But is it unique? Is it the lexicographically smallest one? Not clear. There are lots of isomorphisms. So we want to define a new kind of proof system. Uh, let's just do it with a picture where they can ask questions back and forth. At the end, he outputs a solution or he rejects. And the property is, if in fact there is a solution, forget about this notation, uh, so on an input there is a solution, then this guy will output one. And furthermore, it will be a canonical one. So there is a unique solution that comes up with high probability. So it's very unlikely that you can convince the verifier to output two different solutions. There's really only one he will accept. So in the case of isomorphism, it might be you can convince him not only that there is an isomorphism, but it's a lexicographically smallest one. And we show essentially how to do that. Um, and why is this important if one wants to stick to applications like the Congress? Um, you could say, again, that if I am the government or National Institute of Standards, I show some cryptographic parameters, <laughs> you suspect me that I have a trapdoor. If I can prove to you that no matter what procedure, what randomness I use, I always give you the same parameters, the same prime, then you're happy. So this is, again, the ability to convince someone that what you've given them is a canonical uh, answer rather than an arbitrary answer that they may have chosen maliciously. So this is, I think, it. Uh, I want to say that uh, I want to show you how, that there's still lots of open problems here uh, about finding sh uh, unique shortest vectors, uh, the prime question. Uh, the, another question that people have looked at, or that I think they should look at at least, I've looked at it, is that using this to define some sort of stability for learning algorithms. You all know that machine learning is a big one, and there's a question of how do you come up with a stable um, learning algorithm, how do you define stability? This is one possible way to define stability, that regardless of the weights, you get the same uh, outputs. Uh, regardless, let's say, of the weights that the model, or the machine learning model uh, has. And finally, um, obviously, is, you know, for scientists, the idea of reproducible solutions is, is key. Um, so it's fundamental. It's almost analogous to the truth. And uh, I guess an interesting question is whether you can relax this notion of pseudo-deterministic algorithms to explore verifying um, scientific modeling and simulations uh, where you're using computers. So also randomness plays a big key uh, component and getting different solutions is not um, sort of, then how do you know if it's correct or not correct? So somehow getting the same solution again and again is again very important. So you can ask the same question in other domains, not just in standard textbook algorithms. Thank you.